But you know, this morning as we think about Christmas, there are so many uh, facets of Christmas that enhance our joy. Uh, things like Christmas programs that we're participating in this weekend, Christmas cards that we send each other and receive, uh, Christmas carols, Christmas caroling, Christmas parties uh, and suppers like we've had uh, last weekend, and uh, not the least of which are the uh, Christmas classic movies. Don't you look forward to seeing some of those same movies year in and year out? Uh, it's a Wonderful Life, um, Home Alone, uh, <laughs> the, the Christmas Story. You know, I, I thought of a, a new one I think would make a great Christmas classic, The Night Santa Snapped. You know, can't you just sort of envision some things coming out of that movie, you know? Mrs. Claus running for cover, uh, the reindeer is hiding behind trees, uh, kids running from him in the department store. I think it'd make a great movie. But uh, uh, to, today, next Sunday, and then Christmas Sunday, we're going to be working on this theme of the Christmas movie classics. Uh, today, The Miracle of 34th Street, next Sunday, Home Alone, and, uh, and then Christmas Sunday, uh, It's a Wonderful Life. And I hope that uh, each time you see one of these films uh, advertised, you'll be reminded of a spiritual principle that perhaps we've talked about uh, in the message by the same title. You know, to tell you the truth, with the push to be politically correct these days, I was wondering if I should refer to today's movie not as Miracle on 34th Street, but as Coincidence on 34th Street. But, uh, but if you're promised not to report me to the authorities, we'll push ahead with the use of the word miracle. Uh, you know, the real story of Christmas, the birth of Jesus Christ, involves a miracle, not on 34th Street, but on an unnamed street in Nazareth, almost 2,000 years ago, when a young virgin named Mary was told that she was going to give birth to the Son of God. Actually, there are several miracles, not coincidences, but miracles in the story of the coming of Jesus Christ. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about this morning, the miracles of Christmas. And the first miracle is, is this, simply that, number one, God came to earth. God came to earth. And you know, we've talked about that as Christians and uh, referred to that so many times that it almost loses its miraculous, its miraculous aspect. But think about it. Christmas is a celebration of an invasion. It is a celebration of when God invaded earth. You know, some of us remember it was a big deal when man walked on the moon. But it was a lot bigger deal when God walked on the earth. I mean, in fact, the fact that man walked on the moon fades by comparison when you think that the creator of the universe... Uh, came and walked on this part of the universe that we call uh, earth. Scripture puts it this way in John 1.14, that the Word, and the Word referring to Jesus, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Now, maybe you're thinking, uh, God, I thought we were talking about Jesus. Um, isn't Christmas about Jesus' birthday? Yes, absolutely. But the truth of the matter, and I think all of you know it, is that Jesus was God and is God. He said it himself. The Bible calls him God. He proved he was God by dying on the cross, being resurrected three days later, walking around for hundreds of people to see firsthand. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes it like this in Colossians 1 when he says, In reference to Christ, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And then notice these words, for by Him, that is by Jesus, all things were created. Remember in the book of Genesis it says, let us make man, us, plural. So that means there was somebody there other than God the Father. Well, who was it? God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. So for by Him, Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. Notice anything interesting in that verse? Uh, the truth is that Jesus didn't start in a stable. What we celebrate at Christmas is not the beginning of the life of Jesus Christ. It's the beginning of His life here on earth as a human being. What we're celebrating is the day He came to earth, the earth that Scripture says 
he himself created. Heaven was his home. He owned it. And think about it. It was his perfect place, a place of satisfaction with the best of everything, more magnificent than all the stars on a cloudless night. Heaven was more magnificent than the most beautiful sunrise or sunset you have ever seen, the most beautiful music that you've ever heard. Jerry and I were talking just the other night about if music done by our choir is so awesomely beautiful, can you imagine the music presented by the heavenly choir of angels? Heaven. Jesus was happier than all the happiest days that any of us could have experienced in all of life all piled up together. Heaven was home for Jesus. And the first miracle of Christmas is that Jesus, or God, journeyed from there to here. He moved to our world. I think it's, I started to say it's hard. It's not hard. It's impossible. It's impossible for us to imagine the contrast between heaven and earth. You know, some of us have been in a third world country where things are vastly different than here in Tidewater, Virginia, or in America. Not only that, I know missionaries who have given up this great American lifestyle and have moved to a third world country to live and to communicate the love of Jesus Christ to people who otherwise would never hear it or receive it. They choose to leave this place, America, with all of its luxuries, to go live in a place where homes are shacks, built out of stuff people would typically throw away. Now, that in itself is amazing to me, amazing, but not nearly as amazing as the journey that God made from heaven to earth to leave heaven to come into this world. And that's the first miracle of Christmas, that God himself came to earth about 2,000 years ago. In fact, it is the most significant event in the history of mankind. That's why we celebrate it. That's why it is a big deal. In fact, you all know this. I'm not sure how frequently we think about it, but our calendar is split in half. All of history is split into A.D. and B.C. by this one event, the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is God, is the reference point for every date in history. On the top of your outline, you have Sunday, December the 11th, 2005. That's dated from the time that Jesus made his grand entry into the world. Every time you write a date, who are you using as a reference point? Jesus Christ. Even atheists. <laughs> this is sort of comical in a way. People who, who love to say, I don't even believe in God. Use God as a reference point every single day of their life. Every time they write a check, they use God as a reference point. That's how important it is. God came to earth. Now, unlike man walking on the moon, God coming to the earth didn't start out in some flashy way. He came in a simple way. The first miracle of Christmas was that God came to earth. The second miracle of Christmas was how he came. Number two on your right line, God became a man. God became a man. He became one of us. He became a human being. The message paraphrase says in Philippians 2, 7, When the time came, he, Jesus, set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Think about this miracle. Of all the ways God could have chosen to communicate that there was a God to human beings, he chose to communicate that fact by becoming one of us. I mean, think of what he could have done. He could have written it in the sky that God made the universe, and we could have all looked up and seen it. Uh, Or he could have put on a giant light show. Or he could have invented high-definition television 2,000 years ago and put a flat-screen TV in everybody's home and provided a public service announcement. He could have done anything he wanted to because he's God. But the eternal, powerful Son of God came to earth silently, humbly, as a helpless baby. Think about that. Dwell on that for a moment. As a silent, helpless, well, we're not sure how silent he was, but, <laughs> but as a helpless baby. If you were God, think. Would you come as a baby? I love what 
Ken Geyer in his book, Intimate Moments with the Savior, writes. It's a couple of paragraphs, a little bit long, but listen carefully as he writes. Deity nursing from a young maiden's breast. Could anything be more puzzling or more profound? The divine word reduced to a few unintelligible sounds. Then for the first time, his eyes fix on his mother's. Deity straining to focus. The light of the world squinting. Tears pool in her eyes. She touches his high, tiny hand. And hands that once sculpted mountain ranges cling to her finger. Geyer continues. He says, And so with barely a ripple of notice, God stepped into the warm lake of humanity without protocol, without pretension. Where you would have expected angels, there were only flies. Where you would have expected heads of state, there were only donkeys. Yes, there were angels announcing the Savior's arrival, but only, a band of, but only to a, bland, a band of blue-collar shepherds. And yes, a magnificent star shone in the sky to mark his birthplace, but only three foreigners bothered to look up and follow it. Thus, in a little town of Bethlehem, that one silent night, the royal birth of God's Son tiptoed quietly by as the world slept. Why did God do that? Why did God come to earth as a baby? I think because God said, I'm sending Jesus Christ to save you, not scare you. Nobody's afraid of a baby. You know, think about it. You probably know people who are honestly afraid of God. In fact, they don't really even want to talk about God or their relationship or lack of relationship with God. They get nervous when you talk about Him. You see, if God had come in thunder and lightning and clouds, it would have scared a lot of people to death. But nobody's afraid of a baby. And the fact is, God wants you and me to know Him. He knows all about us, and He wants us to know all about Him. He came to save us. But you see, God had a communication problem because He had to come in a way that we could understand. If God had wanted to communicate to birds... He would have come as a bird. If God had wanted to communicate to frogs, He would have become a frog. But He wanted to communicate to you and to me, so He became one of us. The Bible says He was just like us. He was born like us, the way we were all born. The Bible says He grew like we did, physically, mentally, spiritually, socially. He worked a real construction job for 30 years. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was tempted like we are. He had the same needs, the same drives, the same desires, the same problems, the same pressures in life. And the reason that he went through all of this, the reason God made a strategic decision not to shelter him from the harsh realities of this life, not to shield him by having him born into the make-believe world of the rich and famous, was so he could relate to us. Someone imagined Judgment Day and people from all walks of life standing in line waiting to be evaluated by the Almighty. And some of them began to mumble, who is God to, to judge us? He lives here in this perfect, uh, protected environment. He doesn't know what we went through. And so those people standing in line grumbling formed a committee and they developed a series of accusations against God. They said if he were going to judge them fairly, he would need to experience some of the horrible abuses that they had known on earth. A survivor of the Holocaust, for example, said, let him be born to a despised race. A homeless man insisted, let him grow up in poverty. A grief-stricken teenager whined, let one of his parents die and leave him to weep knife after knife. A man who grew up in a broken home cried, let the legitimacy of his parents be questioned and then grow up in a single-parent home. A blue-collar worker said, let him have to work with his hands to make a living. A divorcee complained, let him be betrayed by someone he really loves. A prisoner of war bitterly suggested, let him be tortured and taunted by enemies who hate him. A terminally ill patient sneered, let him know he's going to die and then have to struggle for every breath. And one, one, one by one, they brought their accusations, and the crowd cheered in agreement after each one. But after they were all read, the audience grew silent because they realized he'd already done every one of those things. 
Jesus had already served his sentence. No one can say God doesn't understand. No one can truthfully say God's not qualified to judge. We read in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. In other words, we don't have a priest who's out of touch with our reality. But we have one who has been tempted in every way. In other words, he's been through it all. Weaknesses, testings, experienced it all, just as we are, yet was without sin. You see, here is a miracle of Christmas. No matter what you're going through today, God understands because he's been there. And that's what Christmas is all about. He came as a human being so he could relate to us. That's the second miracle. But then there's a third miracle also. You see, when God came to earth, the third miracle is he came to ordinary people. He came to ordinary people. When Jesus was born, he didn't come to a select few. He didn't come to a privileged class of people. He didn't even come for religious people, which is so interesting. But he came how? To lowly shepherds. He came for all of us. Consider where Jesus was born. Not in a palace, although he was the God of the universe. He wasn't even born in a nice hotel or a hospital. Luke 2, 7 says that Mary placed him in a manger because there was no room for him at the Hyatt Regency downtown. Well, not quite that, but yeah. But he was born in a manger. There was no room for him in the hotel. Born in a barn. Today we send Christmas cards with this glorious picture of the nativity scene. We talk and sing about how Jesus was born in a manger. But do you know what a manger is? <laughs> it's not very pretty. Not very glorious. It's a feed box for cattle. It's, uh, they put wheat and oats and stuff in it. It's not exactly a real clean place to leave an infant, a newly born baby. Yet that's where God was born. When God came to earth, he came in the stuff of life with the stench of animals. You can't get any lower than being born in a barn. Then consider who saw him first. The first people who got to visit Jesus were not people like Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea or any of the other religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were not royalty. They weren't political figures. The very first people who were invited to see Jesus were the shepherds. Now again, as we present our Christmas programs, there are times that we sort of glorify that aspect of it. But do you know who the shepherds were in that day? They were, they were the heroes of our story, but in those days they were the zeros in society. They were nobodies. So they were considered actually outcast of society because they did a job looking after the sheep that nobody else wanted to do. It wasn't a glamorous job at all. They were the if I can say it, the low life of that day. And that's who Jesus invited first to come to his birth. Now later on, wise men from the east would come and they would bring rich gifts. I think there's something about that from the highest in society to the lowest. They were invited. And I love that because what it means is Jesus is available to all of us. Nobody's left out. He wasn't born upon a hill where we couldn't get to him. He wasn't born behind a gated community. He was born right out in the open where anybody could come and have a relationship with him. And that's the point. That's the miracle of Christmas. God wants to have a relationship with every one of us in this room and every person outside of this room, every person who exists on this earth today. John 1.14, the message paraphrase says, I love this. Jesus became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Isn't that great? Moved into the neighborhood. Now, what's the good news about all this? God meets us where we are. You may think, all the things I've done in my life, I could never have a relationship with God. You're wrong. You may think, God doesn't care about me. I'm a little nobody. Nobody cares about me, and God certainly doesn't have time for me. You're wrong. Dead wrong. God says, I love you. God says, I know you, and I know all that you've ever done, and I want you to know me, and there's forgiveness for all that you've ever done. But greater than the miracle of how Jesus came, greater than the miracle of who he came to, the greatest miracle of all was why he came. And that brings us to the fourth miracle. 
God came to earth for our benefit. He came to earth for our benefit. He came for you and for me. Jesus said it this way in John 12, 47. I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. When the angels announced Jesus' birth to the shepherds that we were talking about, they said, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. The key word being Savior. That's the reason that He came. What do I need a Savior for? Well, stop and think about it. The Bible says that there's a place called heaven where people will live eternally. The only other place is hell. Heaven is a perfect place. There's no sadness in in heaven, no sorrow, no sin, no sickness, no problems, no pressures at all in heaven. Heaven is a place of absolute perfection. That means that only perfect people can get there. Because if that's not the case, if God let imperfect people into heaven, then guess what? It wouldn't be perfect anymore. God's never going to let heaven be anything but a perfect place. And our response, if only perfect people get into heaven, then I don't stand a chance. You're right. (laughs) None of us stands a chance. But that's what Christmas is all about. Jesus had no reason to leave home if it were not for us and his desire that we be able to populate heaven and heaven continue to remain a perfect place. God said, none of you are perfect, so I can't let you into heaven. So here's what I'll do. I will come to earth in the form of a human being and my name will be called Jesus. I will live the only perfect life that has ever lived and then as a gift to you, I will die on the cross to pay for all the imperfections and then if you'll accept that gift, place your trust in me, obey me, I will get you into heaven on my own goodness because you're not good enough. Do you get that? Isn't that a miracle? That's the miracle of Christmas. I call it a deal. (laughs) It's a pretty good deal. I call that the greatest Christmas gift that you or I will ever be offered in our entire life. There was a Christmas card that came out several years ago. In fact, you probably saw it and made me remember this. The Christmas card said, if our greatest need had been information... God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need on earth had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an accountant. If our greatest need on earth had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us a Savior. And we all know it this way. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Folks, that's the miracle, not on 34th Street, but that's the miracle of Christmas. That's God's Christmas gift to each of us. Now, I mentioned this, if you were here last night in the closing, but I've been thinking about it. Can you imagine being given a gift at Christmas and never unwrapping it? <laughs> sort of, well, Bill can because he loses them. <laughs> but, but generally speaking, can you imagine that? It would be silly. I mean, if you gave me a gift at Christmas, and a year later you came over to the house, and you looked down under the tree, and there was that same Christmas gift you'd given me a year ago, and I still hadn't unwrapped it, you'd think I was a little nutty. You'd say, why haven't you unwrapped it? Oh, I love the wrapping paper. I'm sure I'm going to love it when I open it. I'm going to get around to it one of these days. That's silly, isn't it? And yet, many people, perhaps some of you today, continue to move a little closer to God Christmas after Christmas after Christmas after Christmas. You've celebrated every Christmas for as many years as you are old, You know the songs by heart, you know the stories, you know what it's all about, but you've never unwrapped the gift. What's the logic behind that? God is saying, you matter to me. I came to earth 2,000 years ago, grew up, died on the cross, paid for your sins, your ticket's been paid for. All you have to do is accept it. All you have to do is unwrap the gift 
and we'll develop a relationship and I'll be with you for the rest of your life, yet you haven't unwrapped it. Will you make this the year? Will you unwrap it this year? This morning as the praise team comes to lead us in our closing song, that's my question to you. If you've never unwrapped that gift that you've had there for years and you've heard it explained over and over again, will you unwrap it? You say, what do you mean unwrap it? Accept that gift, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ because Jesus died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And if you're here today and you've never confessed your faith that that Jesus, born as a babe in Bethlehem, that that Jesus is the one who went to the, cro to the cross and died for you, that you believe that with all of your heart, that he is the son of the living God, and you're willing to embrace him, to come to repentance, to be buried with him in the waters of Christian baptism, we're ready to assist you in doing that today. Why not unwrap the gift as we...